Okay. We had an attack on WCK workers who are trying to feed Gazans, to trying to help Gazans to put an end to this starvation in that region. Right after this attack, Mossad said that it wasn't Israelis who did this attack. And Tel Aviv spokesman said that Israeli army is abide by international law and they're trying to investigate this case. I want to know what's your take on this attack. Well, there's no mistake. It was the Israelis that did it. The notion that they did this uh, by mistake or unauthorized is what the British call BS or rubbish. Now, how do I know that? Well, one of my colleagues and you, one of your guests, Larry well, Larry Johnson, has worked in these centers. He knows he knows he knows how these drone uh, raids are orchestrated. It's not a simple air person or, or airman or woman or. They have colonels. They have uh, they have majors and captains that uh, that ride herd over this. So there is no drone operator that's going to target a well established target. The information having been having been given uh, by the W, uh, the World Food Kitchen, a world whatever it is, uh, in in advance to these people. So uh, what happened? Well, they tried it. It was well advertised. And the Israelis said, well, you know, we just have to remind everybody again, okay, that this is not possible. We're going to keep our starvation in place, starvation being part of their genocide. But let's not mince words. Those are both war crimes. We're going to keep that in place, and nobody's going to get it, no matter how famous. A world Central Kitchen, well, it doesn't matter if he's a world celebrity chef. Now, he too has said this could not have been a mistake. And what's the difference here? Why is Pitt, why why is uh, Biden so upset this time when thousands and thousands of people trying to supply Palestinians and also the Palestinians themselves running up to these trucks have been decimated by the Israelis? Well, you know, I hate to be... I hate to jump to conclusions, but I'm an analyst, right? And uh, what's the difference between these seven and the rest of them? Well, these seven happen to look like you, the men, and me, okay? They belong to the Lily White Club. Uh, the Lily White Club that is impersonated by NATO. Look at NATO. What's a distinguishing character of NATO? Oh, uh, white, okay. Israel is by de facto member of, of NATO, for God's sake. They've been adopted. So now there was one Palestinian translator. I don't know if they would count them or not, but let's say just six, just six, but six white people, all right? Now, I'm afraid that makes a difference. And that's why Joe Biden is said to be so upset about all this. And now he's saying he could change his policy. Well, I give you, <laughs> I wouldn't bet that he's going to change his policy on this. He just needs to pretend to change his policy. And none of the things that he has done saying, well, Israel has to take steps to make sure this happens again. The Israelis just will not take those steps. And what worries me, of course, is that the starvation continues. People are starving to death while we, the, well, it's on YouTube, for God's sake, or on, at least on social media. We watch it all happen. Now, friends of mine who have tried to, and in one case, successfully resupplied Gaza, this is 12, 13, 15 years ago, uh, have uh, decided to sail from Turkey on a cargo ship and on at least three passenger ships to bring cargo, several tons of it. We're to Gaza, okay? When will they sail? Target is mid-month, so 10 days or so. Right. Whoa, what will happen to those people? My God. I know those people. Some of them were on the U.S. boat to Gaza back in 2011 when we set sail from Athens, from the port of Piraeus, 
to try to get to Gaza on a U.S. registered ship flying the flag of the United States of America. I said ship, but it was not a ship. It was a boat, okay? It carried about 40 of us, some of them pretty prominent people like correspondence from the New York Times, from uh, Democracy Today, from Reuters. Uh, what's her name? There was a very prominent poet with us, and uh, Medea Benjamin and Anne Wright and various are justice-seeking people. Now, we were held in the port of Piraeus on false pretenses for about, for about uh, 10 days back at the end of June, early July, 2011. Uh, finally, we were said, said, said to have been passed all the, all the rules and we were ready set to sail. And then the Greeks said, no, 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 we just look at your air conditioning system and there's a flaw in it. We can't let you, uh, you can't let you leave the port. And so we had a council of war Council of War, a Council of Peace-Loving People. And we said, you know, the Gazans are beginning to starve now. So 13 years ago, okay, we're going to go, okay? And so we all got on a ship at night. We sail, okay? And we sail almost, it was nine nautical miles. We almost got out of the, the, the port of Piraeus when the Greek uh, PT boats and torpedo boats and you know the same thing you saw the Israelis do the year before to that Turkish ship the Mavi Mamara okay well they they blocked our path and our our captain stopped dead in the water and he said what do we do well we had a standoff it was amazing the Greeks loudspeaker very apologetic I mean the oldest nautical power in the world, Greece, right? And say, we really, are, we're really sorry about this, but we have to turn you back. We can't let you go. Why can't you let us go? Well, we're just following orders, okay? After an hour, our captain said, "Look, we need to turn back. They're about to board us, and we don't want to have happen to us what happened to the Mavi Marmara the year before, where nine people were killed, including an American citizen." Nobody objected then. He was also of Turkish origin, so maybe he didn't look like you and me, Nima. Anyhow, that's what we did. We turned back to the to the port. Our boat was that we had paid for refiguring and re, you know, uh, just repairing so it would be boat worthy to cross the Mediterranean. It was impounded. We lost it, and that was the end of that enterprise. Now, why do I mention all that? I was on that boat, of course. Um, we were told before we sailed, that is in, yeah, in late May, early June, 2011, we were told that uh, the administration did not want us to go, that Netanyahu Prime Minister then, as now, was up in arms and saying to our president, you better not let them go. And we heard, I heard personally, from a source very close to the National Security um, uh, Council, which is not NSA, this is the National Security Council of the White House, okay, which uh, Jacob Sullivan now heads. I was told this. As we prepared to board, as we gathered in New York City, from which many of us flew out, uh, out to uh, to uh, to board the boat in Athens, I was told that, uh, and I wrote it up at the time. Very senior staffers of the National Security Council uh, said that not only did the White House plan to do absolutely nothing to protect our boat, the U.S. boat, the U.S. flag boat uh, to Gaza. Um, they would not do anything to protect it from being attacked or illegally boarded. 
but that the White House officials were, quote, or, quote, would be happy if something happened to us, end quote. They are, I'm reliably told, I wrote at the time, quote, perfectly willing to have cold corpses of activists shown on American TV, period, end quote. Now, I published that. Uh, this came as a big surprise to my co-passengers. And they criticized me legitimately for that because I hadn't checked it out with them, for God's sake. You know, I should have. But it was out there, okay? Next thing you know, uh, a good friend of mine, a previous ambassador from the UK to Uzbekistan, who lost his job because they didn't like the UK receiving the results of torture, torture of Uzbek prisoners on uh, the war against terror. His name is Craig Murray. He's Ambassador Craig Murray, and he's a great defender of Julian Assange and a great justice person. So anyhow, here, he's he's driven out of the foreign office, okay? He's no longer a, a UK ambassador, but he still has contacts. So he's in London, and he's reading this thing. Here, here's his old friend McGovern <laughs> writing something that's really hard to believe. So this is what Ambassador Murray writes in his blog. And about, well, about five days after I wrote what I just read you that I wrote, he says, now, I won't, I won't imitate his British accent because he's a, he's a Scot, okay? And the Scots should not be blamed for being British, even though they don't disavow it. Here you go. While I know Ray, says Craig Murray, I know Ray to be an extremely honest man, motivated by a s extreme activist Christianity. Even though I knew all that, I thought it was possible that his source in the White House was exaggerating. I therefore set my own diplomatic source sources to work in Washington. You have sources, especially among those justice people who respect you for objecting to things like torture, okay? That was Ambassador Murray's record. So I reached out to my own diplomatic sources without giving them any indication of what Ray had written. Uh, they came back with an independent report from a different source close to Clinton rather than the White House with exactly the same result of which Ray was warned. I was told that Obama would welcome an Israeli attack on the U.S. boat to Gaza as giving him a chance to confirm his pro-Israeli credentials and improve that his standing with the Israel lobby in our country. Quote, fatalities would not be a problem, period, end quote. Uh, Craig ends up on a more even-handed note by noting that there was no information that the Obama regime had quietly uh, given Netanyahu a green light to actually attack their ship. But I strongly expect they will, says Craig Murray, by deniable means, of course. Now, what happened to us, for those who don't know, is that when they turned us back, as I said, I guess before, they turned us back because they wouldn't let us leave the harbor. And why did they get the 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 country that had such an incredible record for seafaring and so, how did they get the, the 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 Greeks to say no no we're violating all our all our basic principles on freedom of the sea you have a bad air conditioner on your boat it was not a cruise boat for God's sake it was pretty primitive but your air conditioner doesn't work so you can't how did they do that. Well, you remember the Greeks were in severe economic distress. They badly needed an IMF, IMF no loan, and you know who's gonna who's gonna say yay or nay on an IMF loan? The United States. So that's how cynical all this is, and that's how we were served, so to speak, by 
President Obama, who, by the way, was a terrific disappointment, but not the worst of them, okay? Not the worst of them. The worst of them is right now. I have one little footnote to this because as I looked at this last night, kind of in some, in a lot of grief, actually, um, I th I'm not going to be on this boat. <clears throat> and I think I already have some survivors, premature survivors, grief or whatever they call it. <clears throat> but as I looked through my own records at my own website, raymcgovern.com, I came up with this. <laughs> After we got back, we were criticized violently by people like Adam Dershowitz. He called me and he called my passengers every name in the book that he could come up with, including, you know what I was? I was a, a knave. A knave. Mind you, <laughs> yeah, I've been called a lot of things. Name of Nave, <laughs> yeah, that's what we were, knaves. Yeah, I remember Robin Hood or something like that. There were knaves around. Well, anyhow, here we go. Uh, we get back, and it's election season. You know, people are running for president. So here we, here I go up to Manchester, New Hampshire, where there's great political uh, pre-election. Uh, activism going on, and who comes in to uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, but Governor Rick Perry from the state of Texas, okay, and he gets up and he's talking to these, well, you know, you know, these very educated, I, I really, really honor them, these New Hampshire people who would listen to anyone, okay, so they invite Rick Perry, he's there, and, and he says, you know, um, uh, he says, this is really terrible what those people uh, tried to do with respect to getting to Gaza, you know. Uh, hey, Rick, Rick Holder, the attorney general, he should prosecute the passengers that went on that U.S. boat to Gaza. That's what he should do, prosecute them. And so we didn't, you know, I was in the audience, you know, my favorite, my favorite maneuver. So I raised my hand, Governor Perry. Yes, I'm Ray McGovern. I was on that U.S. boat to Gaza. What do you mean that we should be prosecuted for insisting on freedom of the seas? Well, here's how I recorded his response. <clears throat> I love, I love Israel very, 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 very much. Now, he implied that in comparison with rival candidates, well, he just really loves Israel with four varies, not just two or three as the other ones were. And then I said to him, you love Israel no matter what, Governor Perry? And he responded, yeah, that's right, no matter what, end quote. Now, why do I mention that? I mention that because Bibi Netanyahu was depending on what he called in 2001, uh, the U.S. ability to maneuver in the right direction to support Israel, no matter what. He said, and this is on video, it's on YouTube. He said to a diplomatic, to a domestic audience in a, in a, in a uh, living room where he thought the video camera was turned off. He said, you know, the Americans, they, they support us 80 percent it's absurd period end quote his word absurd well it was absurd in 2001 it continued to be absurd witness rick perry in 2011 is it absurd now we'll just have to see after all six white people have been killed now right uh i say that only partly in jest i think the americans are coming around most Americans, and I love my, my countrymen, I think most of them still have a conscience. It's just that the people who rule America, the elites that are in bed with the Zionist crowd in Washington, they don't have a conscience. And we'll have to see how this plays out because there are several months left before the election in November. But getting back to my friends who are uh, on board or about to board uh, those those 
Well, they're, they're ships, okay? Well, one of them's a ship, a cargo ship. The others are passenger boats. Uh, whether they succeed now that they're, now that the example of the World Central Kitchen has been hang out for everyone to see, hung out, uh, we'll see if they get in. There are some hopeful signs, uh, apparently in, in reaction to Biden's reported outrage about what happened. Uh, there will be some entry points for aid, but the whole thing is a charade, Nima. There are thousands and thousands of trucks waiting, waiting to get into Gaza. All they have to do is unlock the key, pull off the lock, and open the gates, and they're in. So what's the what does Netanyahu now say? Well, maybe three places uh, will let some folks in. And one of them, if memory serves, is Ashtod. And many of my friends have been in Ashtod in prison because that's where they've taken previous people from former boats to Gaza. Ashtod is a seaport. It's in southern Southern Gaza, well, southern Israel, just just the north of Gaza. So it's possible. This is just I'm just a pure guess on my part. But if the Israelis do not want to bear the brunt of Biden outrage uh, this time, maybe maybe my friends will be able to escape. Will escape the worst in trying to fulfill the biblical mandate. For God's sake, it's in Isaiah. It's in Matthew. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, and you end up with the sheep, not with the goats at the final judgment. You could take that literally or not. I happen to believe that there's a lot to it, and it will be measured in the end by how much we care about feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and giving drink to the thirsty. Do you think at the end of the day, Netanyahu would come out of all of this problems he's making all around Israel, inside and outside Israel. How do you see the future of Netanyahu? Well, there are two things at stake, and they really kind of joined at the hip. His political future and his personal future. <clears throat> now, I am not an expert in Israeli politics, but I know from, from those who are that if he loses his position as prime minister, He'll end up going to jail, he and his very nice wife, okay, for lots of charges of bribery and everything else, okay? So what does that mean? Well, history is is pockmarked with people who continued wars, perpetrated wars, would not end wars out of personal, personal reasons, whether they were fully conscious of that or not. So... Bear in mind, Netanyahu has this very personal incentive to keep this thing going so that Netanyahu can keep going and Benny Glantz or some other rival does not knock him out of office and imperil his freedom, for God's sake, okay? Now, what does that mean? That means precisely what we're seeing now. It means prosecuting the war. It means when Israel is ready, and this is a key thing that seems to be lost sight of. I don't think the Israeli army is anywhere near ready to go into Rafah, whether it's ostensibly to search out terrorists of Hamas or not. They're not ready. They took a bloody nose uh, elsewhere in Gaza. They need months to prepare. So a lot of this near-term stuff, I think, is uh, synthetic, uh, made up, okay? But and uh, Netanyahu said he's going to do. He's given the order to prepare to go into Rafa and clean that out. What does that mean? Well, most people say there are more a million, more than a million, maybe a million three, a million four people in Rafa now, squeezed down there from the rest of Gaza. And most of those people will be killed if they're not already starved to death. And those who can will break through barriers to get to Egypt or get a sign I get somewhere, okay? Well, that's genocide to a T. Uh, will he do that? Well, there, there's not only his promise, his undertaking to do that. There's not only his personal as well as political stake in doing that, but sorrowfully, Nima, sadly, 
68% of the Israeli people want him to do that or want that done. And his argument, you know, you don't change horses in the middle of a war, you know, well, that has a, a certain uh, certain surface appeal, right? I mean, it may make sense. So the one, you know, again, not an expert, I think that most of the Ameri most of the Israeli people would like him to keep being the hard-nosed guy to prosecute this war. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that Israel is finished. It, it finished, okay? Because Hezbollah from southern Lebanon, just on top of Israel, will not stand still for this. Netanyahu decides to go against Hezbollah as well. And McGovern is not a is not the kind of military expert that his friends like Larry Wilkerson are. And Larry's been on your show, I believe. Larry recently said, yesterday said, when he was asked by Judge Napolitano, can Israel win? Uh, can it win against the Gazans in the South and Hezbollah? And Larry said, no, not alone. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means not without the United States help. Will the United States help? I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that. There's a lot of pressure in our country. I would say no. This is a this is a, a fool's errand. And besides that, uh, we Americans don't like to support genocide, for God's sake. But the ruling elite, you know, <laughs> the ruling elite, my God, you know, that's what I used to criticize Soviet propaganda for. The ruling elite. Come on. <laughs> we don't have a ruling elite in this country. We're a democracy, all right? And then the Pravda used to say things like, Volstritskia Kravavitsi. Okay. Now, I'm fluent. I used to teach Russian, okay? And in those days, we didn't have instant translations, right? So the first time I saw this propaganda thing, it's like, there's no Russian. Vol, 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 uh, Wall Street. Wall Street, Kroff is blood. Pete is drink. Okay, so the, the literal translation was Wall Street, Wall Street blood suckers. And McGovern, young as he was, says, oh, come on, that, that's over the top. You know, the, the Russians, the, this business about the, the elites ruling the imperial world. Come on. Well, you know what? <laughs> Putin is saying the same thing now after being usually much more reserved. And I'm afraid that somebody's going to say, whoa, look at Putin. He's in McGovern's pocket. <laughs> He's in McGovern's pocket. Now, I kid you not, you know. It is the elite. Uh, the leaders of NATO, they're political hacks. What they're doing is destroying their own economies. Leaders of the U.S., what are they doing? They're making the 1%, the, the elite from, from, from capitalism, the people who build the F F-25, all these fancy weapons, they're making them very rich. The rest of us are in a bad shape. So what am I saying here? I'm saying here that uh, I don't know uh, how this is going to come out, but unless uh, <laughs> unless that standard that used to be a top of the you know, uh, workers of the world so unite <laughs> unless the workers of the United States see which end is up. And we only have several months to pick some some other candidate between the two that are now in, in the front foot. Unless the, we wake up, you know, it's gonna come to a very bad end, as the Chinese used to say. And when I say China, uh, as, as you probably remember, Nima. I always need to include China in any conversation, but I always spend 
one paragraph on it, okay? Uh, I learned, having watched Russian relations with China since 1964, do the math, okay? That was my job, my first job at CIA. I learned that the most important thing was what the old Soviets used to call the balance of power, okay? Uh, the international correlation of forces is where it translates from Russian, okay? And it used to be Russia, China, and the U.S., sort of like an equilateral triangle. Now it's smooshed, <laughs> smooshed down to Russia, China, and the U.S. on the short end of the stick. Nowhere was that more evident than when China supported Putin in invading Ukraine. There's no bones about it. Putin got Xi Jinping's support three weeks before he did it. That's clear right now. And no one's up to recognizing that, including our president, who two days ago called Xi Jinping. And the readout from the Chinese was uh, Joe Biden call Xi Jinping and talk to him, and he said, you know, I'm really concerned about you strengthening the Russian economy to fight a war against us. Would you please stop? <laughs> <laughs> and so they're still living in this, this aura of unreality, not only that we are the own, only exceptional or indispensable country in the world, but also that for somehow, we can say, China, you got to help us out here now. These Russians are really bad people. Would you please stop helping them economically? Could you, you know, just, I mean, how, I think that people like Blinken and Sullivan may think that they could do that. They may also think that they can stave off definitive retreat, definitive defeat in Ukraine until after the election. I don't think they could do that. If, they're, if they had any smarts in them at all, they need to realize that not only Putin, but Lavrov is saying, look, you guys, now's the time to negotiate, okay? Do not even think about sending NATO troops into Ukraine. They will be destroyed. And not only that, do not even think of sending F-16s up to do battle in Ukraine because not only will they immediately be destroyed, but the airfields from which they fly will also be destroyed. We don't want a wider war. Just, just remember that this is what's going to happen. And I believe that in this case, this is literally true. That will happen if the French send these 2,000 troops into Ukraine on this uh, charge of the French brigade. <laughs> Ours not to reason why ours put to do or die. They're going to die, okay? And then what's going to happen? The first, oh, we're NATO troops. So as we have warned, Larry Larry Wilkerson and I wrote a, a major op-ed warning the president, uh, look, uh, it, actually, that was a different op-ed. This is a, a draft by Scott Ritter under the auspices of Veteran Intelligence Professionals of Sanity. We said, look, uh, just please make it clear that if the French call for NATO support, uh, having gone in unilaterally, or perhaps with some of those Baltic states, maybe even Poland, it's not a NATO thing. You're not going to use NATO forces. You're not going to use, you're not going to even think about using NATO nuclear weapons. Please make that clear now before it happens. Now, there have been steps toward making that clear, but apparently, the French and others are actively contemplating doing that. Why? As a way not to have lost lost the war in a way that imperils their own electoral prospects. And whereas they probably won't end up in prison like Netanyahu will if he's displaced, uh, they're not going to be very popular and their whole political fortunes will go down the drain. Um, Lots more can be said about the existing situation in Ukraine. Sorry to get off on that track, but 
it's a very similar situation. And I'll just say one more thing that as much as I've said about Netanyahu having a personal stake in remaining in office, well, not only Joe Biden, but Tony Blinken, Jacob Sullivan, they have an equally important personal stake not to lose the election. Here's the here's the reasoning. If Ukraine is lost, if let's say House Speaker Mike Johnson approves sixty billion dollars more good money to throw after bad, and Ukraine still loses. Biden will not be able to blame that on the Republicans. He'll have to find some other way to make sure that this doesn't go down really south until after the election. Why? Because if he loses in Ukraine, a sense clearly, okay, then he loses the election. You know, I'm not a domestic political person, but it seems to me very clear that if you lose after all those promises, and if NATO falls apart because of your policies in Ukraine, you're going to lose that election, no matter who you're running against, okay? Oh, so he loses the election. Who comes in? The likely candidate comes in. And does he have some grudges against Biden? <laughs> does he have grudges? He said more than grudges. Does he have a lot of evidence against Jacob Sullivan, the author of Russiagate? Does he have evidence against Tony Blinken, who was responsible for rounding up those 51 former intelligence directors to say a week before the last election that Hunter Biden's laptop was the result of a Russian disinformation intelligence operation. It's in court testimony. That's exactly what Blinken, there's got to be a law against that, right? So all I'm saying here is these three, especially, I mean, they have personal incentive, equal or maybe even more powerful, well, equal at least, to what Netanyahu, their bird of a feather, faces in Israel. It's a hell of a set of circumstances, isn't it? But these personal political circumstances, including the possible deprivation of personal freedom, like jail for a couple of years, uh, lies in wait for both these people. And so I think that needs to be cranked into the calculus. And I don't find too many other people doing that. 